Hi, hello everybody. Uh, this is Matthias Friedrich from uh, Montreal. Uh, welcome to today's uh, CMA Journal Club. It's the first after a, quite a long summer break, uh, so I'm happy that uh, you are showing up here. I'm particularly happy to, to see that Julian Lütgens from uh, Bonn is also uh, joining because it will be about um, uh, a paper they recently published. <clears throat> and. Um, before we get started, I uh, just want to remind everybody, if you're not speaking or do not intend to speak to everybody, just mute yourself um, uh, using the, the controls uh, in Zoom. And uh, whenever you want to speak up, just unmute yourself and uh, start talking. Or if you want to ask a question but do not want to necessarily um, do that uh, by voice, you can always type something in the chat. Um, um, either to me or to everybody, and uh, then I can answer, ask that question for you or bring up that point. Okay, so first of all, uh, welcome Julian, and uh, just to provide the context, uh, and I hope you can see my shared screen. Uh, in 2009, well, um, we had a, um, several, uh, that was the result of several meetings, we had gathered an expert group uh, consisting of imagers, pathologists, and clinical cardiologists, and uh, put together the so-called Lake Louise criteria. Those are cardiac MR-based criteria for the evidence of the presence of myocardial inflammation in patients with clinically suspected acute uh, myocarditis. And uh, at that time, the body of evidence we had indicated that we should probably best use a combined set of criteria. So what we did. We identified three uh, criteria, um, and uh, one was based on an early enhancement, one was based on a late enhancement, and one was based on the presence or absence of edema. Uh, so we, at that time, uh, concluded that if you have two out of these three criteria, that would uh, be uh, good evidence for the presence of myocardial inflammation. And since then, the Lake Louise criteria, as they have been known since, um, have been used uh, basically worldwide. And uh, a lot of papers have assessed their validity um, partially uh, in the appropriate clinical setting in acute myocarditis, uh, others in a less appropriate setting in like chronic, because the Lake Louise criteria actually were never meant to assess chronic myocarditis. However, there's a point uh, in, in arguing it could be used to identify active myocarditis. Nevertheless, they were uh, good, but then, uh, of course, um, uh, if you have something better, then it's replacing the good. So last year, we published uh, the, an, an update of the Lake Louise criteria, and it, uh, Vanessa Ferreira was the first author. And uh, what we did uh, at that time, and... Uh, um, Sorry, I don't have the, the paper open here now. <clears throat> what we did, uh, we uh, changed it from one to, uh, from three to two criteria, and maybe I use actually already um, the figure in uh, Julian's paper. So instead of uh, saying any out of two out of the three, we say we need one criterion that is based on T1 and one on T2. Why the T2? T2 is clear, that's uh, water sensitive, that's edema, that's uh, suggestive of acute uh, inflammation, whereas T1 could be acute or chronic, so it doesn't allow us to say anything about the acuity. Um, and so um, this also was a long process, and we, the intention of the new criteria was to um, integrate mapping, yes, but of course, uh, overall, not just for doing that, but for uh, the, the purpose was to improve the accuracy. And specifically, uh, the, an issue with the original Lake Louise criteria was that the sensitivity was not as high as we would want to have it. So the overall accuracy was good uh, in the 80%, but the sensitivity was between 65 and 75%. Um, so that is the background. And now I would like to hand over to uh, Julian Lütgens. He's from the University Hospital in Bonn, in the radiology department there. And uh, Julian, feel free to share the screen. I have unshared mine, so uh, using this uh, green button. Um, so um, uh, Julian and his team, they already have uh, published quite uh, a number of papers 
on the topic of myocarditis, so they're very well uh, experienced and uh, have contributed um, a lot of interesting data. So I'm very happy to welcome you, Julian, and uh, looking forward to walking us through, uh, the, uh, through your work here with the PDF. Yeah, thank um, you very much, Matthias, uh, for this nice introduction. And uh, I'm very glad to be here and uh, to show you the results of our recent studies. So um, this recent paper is a um, um, comparison of the original and the 2018 Lake Lewis criteria. And as we found out over here, it's a result of a validation cohort. And to fully understand uh, this paper and also the cutoff values used in this paper, we have to have a short look at our initial study, uh, which was study which, which was published in 2015. And this study this is important. It uses the same imaging protocol as today's uh, paper. And in this study, we investigated 34 patients with acute myocarditis, and they underwent a comprehensive imaging protocol with T1 relaxation times and T2 relaxation times. And in this cohort, uh, we established the cutoff values for myocardial T1 relaxation times with 1,000 milliseconds using the uh, Jodens index. And we also established some cutoff values for the T2 relaxation times which was 55.9 milliseconds. And in this paper, we could already show that the area under the curve of native T1 and native T2 was higher compared with those of the other CMR parameter. And in our conclusion, we already said that native mapping techniques have the potential to replace current Lake Lewis criteria. And so we all know what happened. So in 2018, the uh, Lake Lewis criteria were revised accordingly. And all, I want to make some more remarks uh, uh, on this topic. And um, T1 mapping and T2 mapping, they were included in the Lake Lewis criteria. And as Matthias pointed out, uh, T1 mapping is especially sensitive in uh, detecting myocardial disease. And it has a high negative predictive value to rule out myocarditis or a diffuse cardiac disease. And it was implemented in the new score as a T1-based criterion together with their extracellular volume and the late gallium enhancement. And also T2 mapping is uh, highly sensitive for the detection of myocardial edema and it has a high positive predictive value for myocarditis. And therefore it was also added to the new Lake Louise criteria as a T2-based uh, criterion. So we have this T1-based criterion and we have this T2-based criterion. And now you can make the diagnosis of myocarditis if two of these, these uh, criterions are positive. So and what we did in our study uh, in patients with acute my myocarditis, we uh, wanted to compare the diagnostic performance of the original Lake Lewis criteria and the 2018 version for the diagnosis of acute myocarditis and simultaneously validate previously reported cutoff values for parametric mapping techniques. So um, I go ahead to the uh, materials and methods. And uh, this was a prospective study and um, it included patients with uh, clinically defined acute myocarditis. And this uh, clinically su clinical suspicion was the reference standard against all parameters were tested against. And acute myocarditis was diagnosed based on diagnostic criteria of the ESC. And patients had signs of inflammation, they had chest pain, they had shortness of breath, and uh, also coronary artery was ruled out prior to cardiac MRI. And for myocardial T1 mapping, we used the same sequence as in the study of uh, 2015. We used the standard 335 MOLLE sequence. And also the T2 mapping sequence was the, was the same. And in this uh, study, we used a T2 mapping sequence based on the gradient spin echo technique. And uh, we investigated the T1 and T2 relaxation times with a global, uh, in, a global approach. So we measured the apical slice, the mid-ventricular slice, 
and also the basal slice. And uh, all of the late use criteria were also investigated. So um, um, I want to jump to the results. So we included 66 patients in this study and um, 26 patients were controls and 40 patients had the diagnosis uh, of acute myocarditis. And um, this point is also very important. Cardiac MRI was performed only four days after hospital admission. So we know from previous studies that especially the, the time uh, from admission to CMR is very important for the sensitivity of uh, cardiac magnetic resonance to detect myocardial edema. So in the normal course of myocarditis, the inflammation is very high during the first days. And if you make like an MRI like two or three weeks, weeks later, you might miss some patients with an inflammation or only a focal or subtle inflammation. So this may contribute to the uh, high uh, um, diagnostic values we observed in our study. And um, I will jump to the cardiac MRI results. So um, obviously patients with acute myocarditis had elevated parameters of myocardial inflammation. And you can see this over in here in this uh, table. So here are the myocarditis patients and here are the healthy control patients. And as you can see over here, the myocarditis patients, they had higher T2 signal intensity that higher or more or, or had a high amount of physical, visible myocardial edema, and also they had elevated uh, T1 relaxation times, ECV, and T2 relaxation times. And um, what's also interesting is that patients with positive 2018 Lake Louise criteria had higher T1 and T2 relaxation times compared with patients uh, with ne negative T2, uh, 2018 Lake Louis criteria. So um, what's, about of, what's about the diagnostic performance of the original Lake Louis criteria and the 2018 version? So in our study, using the already published cutoff values, the original Lake Louis criteria yielded a sensitivity of 72.5% 70, uh, and a specificity, specificity of 96.2%. And the sensitivity of the 2018 version was 87.5% and the specificity was 69.2%. Uh, and the sensitivity of the 2018 late use criteria was significantly higher compared with the sensitivity of the original late use criteria but we did not observe any uh, significant difference in specificity. So compared with the original Lake Lewis criteria, the 2018 version allowed the di additional diagnosis of six patients in our study. So six patients were missed by the conventional Lake Lewis criteria and we could uh, diagnose an additional six patients with a new version. And uh, in these patients, um, uh, three patients were diagnosed due to uh, increased myocardial T1 and T2 relaxation times, and another three patients were with positive late cardiac enhancement were detected by uh, or were diagnosed with an increased T2 relaxation time. And um, also the T1-based criteria and the T2-based criteria yielded a relatively high area under the curve. And the T1-based criteria had an AOC of um, 0.85%. Or or and the T2-based criteria had an area under the curve at 087 And this is quite high when you compare it to the uh, original Lake Louise criteria and also the 2018 version. And the sensitivity and specificity of both criteria did not significantly differ between their newer versions. So as you also pointed out in the uh, original manuscript of the 2018 version, if you have a high suspicion of acute myocarditis, you can also you only use also one criteria to uh, diagnose the disease. So um, those were the results. And um, 
So the main finding of the study are that the diagnostic performance of the 2018 Lake Louise criteria was significantly higher compared with the original approach. And uh, we also showed that previously published or obtained uh, cutoff values can be used to uh, diagnose uh, the disease. And uh, this is important because uh, when you look at the literature, you find a lot of approaches for myocardial T1 mapping and also myocardial T2 mapping. And uh, it is always important if you use myocardial mapping technique that you always use the same sequence on the same scanner process the sequence that you uh, can obtain uh, reproducible results. So um, like we did in our study, it is important to obtain uh, reference, your own reference values for myocardial T1 relaxation time and T2 relaxation times that you adequately uh, uh, use this new uh, 2018 Lake Louise criteria. And um, the increase of myocardial T1 in acute myocarditis is mainly driven by an edema, but also vasodilatation, hyperemia, and the extension of the exocellular space. And it's also um, important to mention that myocardial T1 is also increased in more chronic forms of myocarditis, and it could, can, also be on, can only also be increased in forms of uh, myocardial uh, Therefore, the myocardial T1 mapping have a, has a high negative predictive value for ruling out diffuse myocardial disease. In the setting of an acute myocarditis, however, it can provide a high diagnostic performance uh, if you uh, have the appropriate clinical setting. So, and the same holds true with myocardial T1 mapping. And uh, myocardial T1 mapping is a sensitive parameter for myocardial edema and also has a very high diagnostic performance in the clinical setting of acute myocarditis. And uh, because of its specificity for inflammatory alteration, it was added as a T2-based criterion in the uh, update of the Louise criteria. Um, and compared with our previous studies results, uh, we obtained with the same cutoff values and, um, and nearly the same diagnostic accuracy for myocardial T2 mapping, which is also an interesting fact because it shows that you can, that it shows that the technique is reproducible and you can use, use it in the uh, clinical setting. So um, what about the diagnostic performance of the 2018 Lake Louise criteria? Um, this was uh, mainly or was improved by the implementation mainly due to the mapping techniques. And it's also important that the original Lake Louise criteria might be further used in clinical practice because it can be achieved and obtained on every MRI system. I just want to point out some um, uh, limitations of our study. So uh, this was not a real world setting. This is important to know because the patients were pre-selected because they had a high clinical evidence for myocarditis and um, the reported parameters of diagnostic performance has therefore be regarded as study specific. And also we also only in uh, included patient with an acute myocarditis and therefore the proposed cutoff values are primarily valid for the described subgroup of patients and cannot be obtained to patients with other clinical presentation or with a chronic myocarditis. So, but we concluded in our work that multiparametric cardiac MRI has a high diagnostic value for the diagnostic of patients with acute myocarditis and the 2018 Lake Louise criteria significantly enhance the diagnostic performance of myocardial, uh, of cardiac MRI by increasing its sensitivity due to the higher sensitivity of the mapping techniques. So this was a short overview of our, our recent paper in radiology cardiothoracic imaging. And uh, Matthias just wrote me an email to also uh, say some words about another recent study uh, of our group, which was published in uh, JCMR. And it's a work from uh, Dr. Dabir 
and uh, Dr. Darby asked himself uh, which me measurement approach is the best to diagnose uh, acute myocarditis. So as I pointed out, we used a global measurement approach in uh, our uh, study I just presented. But if you look at the literature, you can see a lot of more measurement approaches out there. So we have the global approach where you uh, do like your region of interest analysis in the apical slice, in the midventricular slice, and in the basal slice. But there are also studies, they only do like one slice of myocardial T2, T1 mapping or T2 mapping in the midventricular axis. And uh, you only obtain the uh, relaxation times in this midventricular slice. And this is called uh, the, the MSEX uh, uh, approach or the short axis approach. And also some authors propose only measure, to only measure the relaxation times in the septum because you don't have this, this movement of the lateral wall in the septum and uh, it's not that prone to motion artifacts. And this is called, also called the concept uh, approach. And what Dr. Darby da uh, did in the study, he compared all measurements approach, approaches, the global approach and the midventricular MSEX approach and also the concept approach. And he also added another approach, the remote uh, uh, um, approach where he measured the relaxation time only in areas where no necrosis or edema was present on the T2 weighted or on the late gadolinium enhancement images. And uh, then he figured out, well, he wanted to know what is the best measurement approach to uh, diagnose acute myocarditis and uh, what, he, what, what he found is that uh, all measurement approaches revealed a significant, uh, significantly higher T1 and T2 relaxation time, as well as ECV values <coughs> in the respective myocardial regions uh, compared in, in the myocarditis patients compared to the healthy controls. And what is interesting is that the global measurement approach showed the highest diagnostic performance regarding all ma mapping parameters. So it has an, it had an higher area under the curve compared to the concept approach, compared to the MSEX approach, and also compared to the uh, remote approach. And um, there were also significant differences in the diagnostic performance between the global and the remote approach regarding T1 relaxation times and ECD. And uh, further, the global measurement approach revealed significantly higher T1 relaxation times compared to the concept approach and nearly significant differences compared to the MSEX approach. And they also did like an uh, intra and inter observer agreement analysis. And this showed that the global measurement approach showed the highest intra and inter observer agreement uh, regarding the commonly used measurement approaches. But so uh, if you want to do it like on a high expert level, the myocardial T1 and T2 mapping in acute myocarditis, according to this paper, it is, uh, it is good if you use like the global approach, but it's also important to mention that all measurement approach allowed for a reliable diagnosis of acute myocarditis. So this was just a short overview over this paper, which got uh, recently published. So and I see, I have a look at the clock and I see we're almost done with our time. So maybe we have some questions. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Jörn. It was great uh, walking us through that. And you're right, we are almost uh, at the top of the hour here. Um, so um, for me, I have to say, uh, your previous papers were also important for our discussions in the expert group. So you had a strong influence on the update of the Lake Louis criteria. Uh, just wanted to say that because uh, your data set was uh, one of the, the key uh, pieces of information we used. Uh, we also have here on the, uh, in, in our webinar today, Matthias Gutberlet. Uh, he wrote uh, together with Dr. Lücke, uh, who's also here, uh, the editorial in uh, radiology cardiothoracic imaging, which is one of the actually the newer imaging uh, journals. Um, and uh, Matthias, you're, in your editorial, you uh, on one hand, you congratulated the authors just as I uh, did, but you also mentioned that more work is needed. And you also mentioned uh, 
say, the work that may have to be done in, in terms of chronic uh, myocarditis. Uh, so do you want to briefly comment on that? Uh, this, uh, don't forget to unmute yourself when you're speaking. Um, Matthias, I, I think we cannot hear you, although your microphone seems to be on. Do you hear me now? Yeah, yeah, now you're on. Hi, Matthias. Okay. Yeah, so, um, yeah, again, congratulations, Julian, uh, to that nice paper. You were the first one who uh, compared the uh, old and the new uh, Lake Lewis criteria and uh, also achieved very good results. Uh, and uh, that is of clinical importance because all of the audience probably who is doing cardiac MI knows that uh, myocarditis or the suspected myocarditis is one of the most important indications in, in cardiac MR. So it's of real value what you have done. Uh, and you may also mention that with T1 and T2 mapping, we have uh, more reliable parameters. They are quantitative, that, that's uh, one important, and has higher diagnostic performance compared to others. And especially what we pointed out in the editorial is that with the new Lake Louise criteria, from our point of view, and also with your results, you showed that T2 mapping uh, is, uh, or T2 imaging at all, is re-evaluated with that uh, with that data, and I think that that's very important to keep that in mind because in acute myocarditis, what you mainly have uh, looked at, T1 mapping probably stands on a T1 mapping mainly for edema imaging, like T2 does. But in if you go to more chronic disease and more diffuse disease, then there might be an overlap with T1 mapping with edema and fibrosis. And therefore, especially from, from our results from the MyRacer trial, we experienced that uh, T2 mapping is very beneficial, especially in chronic disease. So therefore, we think that we should use that new Lake Louise criteria, and you also should use it in suspected chronic myocarditis or in other cardiomyopathies, we don't know yet uh, if that's myocarditis or not. And we think that especially in that group, um, the evaluation with biopsy is um, very important because at the moment, the most studies like you did uh, use the clinical scenario and the clinical um, appearance of the patient as the gold standard. And I think that that that's that's fine in an acute setting, but the clinical demand is is more on the chronic side because if you can clinically evaluate myocarditis quite precisely and you only want to to prove it by MR, then it already works quite well, even with the with the older Lake Louise criteria, but now with the T1 and T2 mapping much better. But the clinical need is definitely on uh, the uh, more chronic side. So therefore, uh, I want to encourage, of course, your group and all the others to use that new criteria and especially T2 mapping in, uh, in, in patients with suspected chronic myocarditis. Okay, thank you, Matthias, for your uh, view as, as the, the, the author of the auditor. So we have a, a, a question from Attila from Budapest. Uh, so, uh, and or a comment, he said, we take a look at the global values and also some targeted regions of interest for the septum and also the lateral wall as well. So um, uh, that is, uh, so basically that's consistent. Then from Niels Menk, uh, a question uh, whether you used an offset. Um, so Julian, do you want to comment on that? Um, so now we don't use an offset. Uh, in, uh, for uh, the mapping. And I also see another question regarding the motion artifacts. Uh, um, how do you account for motion artifacts that can often contaminate 
these method acquisitions. And I think this is an important question because uh, if we investigate really ill patients, we have also on uh, patients uh, who can, can't adequately hold their breath and uh, this uh, will reduce the image quality of uh, the myocardial mapping. And um, in this cases, if we have patients who can't uh, hold their breath uh, um, to obtain an imaging result or image quality that we can adequately address, uh, we have some tools for motion correction and uh, in our setting it is included in the Philips uh, Intelli uh, workstation. And, uh, but uh, sometimes uh, the motion artifacts measures the raw data actually and we only um, and the uh, re reasons of interest okay thank you very much uh Julian. so um, with that, we're uh, at the up, actually at the top of the hour. So thank you very much again, everybody, for joining. Before I let you go, I just wanted to uh, uh, point to the next week's, uh, or in two weeks, we have the next journal club, and that will be about uh, also a very interesting topic, and that is uh, interventional CMR. So we'll look at this paper from Vivek Muthurangu's group. It's uh, called Vascular MR guided right heart catheterization in a conventional CMR environment, so with a regular scanner, predictors of procedure success and duration in pulmonary artery, artery hypertension. So I'm looking forward to that. And uh, with that, I want to wish you a great evening. Thanks for the participants of the discussion, especially Julian and Matthias for joining. And I uh, hope to see you next time. And uh, have a good day or a good evening, wherever you are. And uh, um, all the best in your clinical work in